If we're thinking about pricing power and the companies that have it and those that don't, where would you want to put your money? What sectors? Yeah, we've been looking a lot at this, this concept of uh, pricing power, focusing on companies that are able to withstand the inflationary pressures that potentially lead to higher input costs and uh, put pressure on some of their margins. Here we're looking at companies uh, in the tech sector that are uh, have good uh, cash on balance sheet, good ROE and, and balance sheet fundamentals, and are able to retain their pricing power. So they, they're able to pass on some of those extra costs to consumers without hurting the consumer demand and also some of these global brands strong global brands within luxury but also beyond the luxury sector that are able to withstand that i'm really curious what you say about tech which is interesting because the market often views tech as being a long duration business rates go up you don't want to necessarily own that because you're discounting future cash flow but what you're saying is that they probably have better pricing power than others how do i put those two things together and, and how does it net out it's really a relative trade, as, as you say. So when I think about the equity view here, we need to think about barbelling in our portfolio. So focusing on some of these exposures that do do well when uh, rates are um, going up, uh, you know, looking at sectors like financials and exposures like value, but also focusing on the companies on the other side of the quality barbell tech, despite the headwind from uh, tightening, and it is, you know, the caveat here is that there's a lot, a lot of hawkishness already priced in, sure. in the market. So despite that, focusing on those names in technology and quality that can do well because of their ability not to hurt consumer demand, their ability to defend their margins. Okay, so that's on the sector level. What about on a regional level? We saw with the Bank of America fund manager survey, which Guy was pointing out to me earlier, people starting to turn away from Europe a little bit. Are you? Actually, when we look at Europe, and here I'm speaking about European equities, we've started to see a pickup from uh, ETF flows tilting towards European equities uh, as of the start of the year. And that trend has really continued even in February. So here I'm looking at exposures uh, within the European equity space, uh, like uh, Eurozone equities, so Europe X UK uh, benchmarks, but I'm also looking at uh, financial sector exposures within Europe. And that tilt, um, you know, when we think about uh, uh, Europe's uh, positioning with regards to how much is priced in for the ECB, and as well how Europe is doing in the earnings season that's wrapping up over the next couple of weeks, I think that tilt from investors that we're seeing in ETF flows could, could continue, could have legs. People are looking for hedges. They're trying to figure out how they deal with the inflation narrative that looks like it could become embedded for at least a while. Uh, we're seeing money moving into commodities and, uh, and other areas. Um, certainly into the rates market, we're looking at, at floating loans and, and what is uh, a much better place to be from a protection point of view when interest rates are potentially rising. But let's just focus a little bit on the commodity story. In terms of the flows that you're seeing, is there any sign that they're slowing down, picking up? Is that hedging process accelerating, decelerating? I'm wondering kind of where we are, how much further or, or not we have to go in this process. Uh, yeah, I would really break up that commodity space into two areas where we're seeing interesting trends. The first is really looking at uh, the energy side of things and industrial metals. And the second is really looking at precious metals. Yep. Within the first uh, bucket, we have seen some pickup in, in flows in energy exposures, which is uh, you know to be expected given the uh, moves that we've seen in the oil price. And energy producers have really lagged relative to oil prices, so they could uh, continue to, 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 to pick up uh, from there. On the precious metals side, gold ETPs have started just now, you know, in the past couple of weeks, pick up some demand. It's very nascent, it's very early to call whether that has trends to continue, the, the, gold, the gold space. But what is interesting is gold producers, so gold equities, which have so far lagged and uh, you know whilst we started to see the first move in, in gold uh, gold etc is we could start to see that translate into the gold equity sector so while we're talking about what we're hedging obviously inflation is one that people are looking for what about geopolitical risk kareem or kareem how do you how do you view that I think, you know, of course, the geopolitical risk uh, that we're seeing in markets at the moment does present some uh, challenges in the, in the near term. But when we zoom out, I think a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, these types of uh, uh, geopolitical events can cause uh, market uh, uh, gyrations and, and market volatility in the near term, but don't tend to have a very lasting impact 
on markets when uh, not altering fund fundamentals. So um, the, the other area is uh, really going back to the gold conversation that we just had. I think this is one of the drivers. The geopolitical risks are one of the drivers why we've started to see some pickup in those gold exposures.